Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second Intel Galileo Explorer Hangout, where we're talking and then going to be concentrating on um, educational potentials by the Galileo in particular, but just this new breed of, of tools that children have access to and students and adults have access to now. Um, so we'll introduce ourselves first. I'm Steve Davey, Director of Education and Communications at Maker Ed. And I'm Nancy Ring, the Program Coordinator here at Maker Ed. We have with us in the grade um, no camera format, uh, Carlos Contreras from Intel. Carlos, can you introduce yourself? Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, as Steve mentioned, I work for Intel Corporation, um, uh, manage our U.S. education programs, and I'm also a Maker Ed uh, board member. Thanks, Carlos, for joining us today. Darren. Hi, everyone. I'm Darren. Um, I'm a designer, maker, physicist, wear many hats based in New York City. And I do a lot of work with schools and museums here around maker education and tinkering. And I love any opportunity to try something new. So I've been playing around with the Galileo board this summer. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Great. And uh, our friends at the Children's Museum of Houston, can you introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'm Rahul. And I have been working on a vending machine using the Galileo. Um, all of us at the Children's Museum here have been working on very different projects to see just what the Galileo is capable of. So, hi, uh, I'm Juan. I'm one of the also the interns uh, here at the museum. Well, actually, I ended my internship two weeks ago, but I'm here just kind of hanging out. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. And I'm John. I've been working on a, a simulated sun for a sundial project that we have here at the museum. Kids will be able to make their own sundials, and then they'll be able to put it under our sun and test it in the different hours of the day. And it's all built in Galileo. Super cool. Awesome. Super cool. Kenneth. Hello. Uh, I'm Kenneth uh, Uh I've been playing around with the Galileo this summer. Um, just trying to get it connected to the internet and get it interacting with the real world. Uh, and it's been fun so far. Nice. Yeah, thanks. great. We'll take this moment to um, point out the Q&A app. Yeah, I'm here taking questions. So uh, sure. if there are any viewers out there who have some questions, hop onto the Q&A app. Um, or you can make a comment on YouTube. And I will, uh, once it pops up, I'll post that question. Yeah. I should mention that there's a bit of a lag between uh, what we do live and what you see. So um, you can ask questions at any time, and we'll be able to address them throughout the broadcast. Yes. So you can make comments and that sort of thing. So this is not quite live. There's a, a small, about 20-second delay. Um, so with that, let's get right into the meat of, of the matter, the, the educational possibilities. And I think that we can actually kind of um, approach that more from starting out what, it, what your projects are you're going on. Then we can have a more general discussion about the potential. And I'll share a little bit about what I saw with middle school students and Intel representatives last week that got me really excited for what this board is capable of. Um, but we'll start with uh, project um, updates and what you're working on. Um, I should also mention that I put a comment in our event page that has links to the blog posts uh, made and the work that, we, that will be referred to by the folks that are on today. So uh, Darren, can you describe uh, what you've been working on a little bit more? Sure. So I have been working on this project, which I have for now called the Galileo Heat Map. And basically, um, I wanted to use the internet capability of the Galileo board, but also try to do something that's a little bit trickier on the Arduino side as well. And so it's a touch-responsive world map. And the idea is when you touch a certain city or location, it's not very local right now, since this is just a prototype. Um, there's a Peltier cooler embedded in the map, and that basically creates a temperature differential. And with a temperature sensor, I'm able to heat a small aluminum plate to that temperature so you can touch it and feel what the weather is like, or rather the temperature is like in that part of the world. Um, so this is sort of a prototype. The ideal, I think, would be to have sort of a metal globe that you touch and you can feel the temperature all over. And just really playing off of this idea of connecting places and being able to activate objects. That's super cool. Yeah. I can imagine uh, um, 
a remote control little water squirter too if it's raining somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I told some friends who are like, you should go all out. It should snow. It should rain. <laughs> but... well, I think, yeah, the, the neat thing about the, your idea is that because it involves maps, you know, locality, um, visceral touch, yeah, and everything touch, like that, yeah. it's a really it's a different form of interface, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah definitely something that I think. I really only, I mean, it's so natural for me to touch a map, but to be able to make that reactive is something that's really what things like the Arduino and technologies like this can do. So, anyway. Oh, super cool. I'm going to be super curious when, you, when I see your prototype in person someday. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's the actual really resolution? Cool. Yeah. What's the resolution? Right there. I'll bring it up. <laughs> I'm curious what the resolution for temperature, you know, touch is. You know, can you tell by touch? the difference between a 60, 50 degree day, 70 degree day, you know, what's that going to feel like? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. No, we'll find out. <laughs> really cool. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to Kenny and then we'll go to and, and um, go back to Houston. Kenny, can you tell us what you've been working on? Yeah. Um, so I've been exploring a bunch of different like web services that were like sort of in intermediaries for like the Galileo. Um, there's one called like Will Ladrian, uh, one called Perempu. Um, but I've been trying to get the Galileo interacting with the internet in a really simple and clear way, uh, and then trying to figure out how to take that information and database it. So, like, just trying to interact with those things. Um, I'm still sort of playing around with ideas right now. Um, I'm thinking about um, creating, like, a super sweet cat room for one of <laughs> for this cat we just got. Um, we just got a cat at my house, uh, which is awesome. But um, I want to create like a web connected cat like room that maybe like uh, the cat can like when a scratch post is being scratched, the cat can like tweet about it or something. Like there'll be some sort of Twitter account or maybe like some like motion detectors and laser pointers. I'm still playing around with it. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to have fun with it so far. Really great. <laughs> well, having fun is one of the operative words there, yeah. isn't it? I mean, yeah. Playing around with something that has such great potential and that can connect to things like big data and entertain cats and yourself, that's pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I know you're cooking up a lots of really cool stuff in Houston. Uh, speaking of cooking up, Carlos just shared it's 104 degrees right now in, in, uh, in Phoenix. Oh, I can Holy uh, cow. Sorry, yeah, I was like, there's a little bit of a delay between uh, our microphone unmuting, and I wasn't sure if you can hear me. Is everything good? We can Everything's hear you. Good. Yeah, yeah. We're good. Yep. All right. um, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm working on a vending machine, and so what that entails is motor control uh, from the Galileo. And um, a lot of, a very popular motor shield is the Adafruit motor shield, which I know. Uh, I've learned recently that people have had success with the uh, V2, but we only have the V1 here, and I know a lot of people have V1 sitting at home, and so there's no reason that we should sort of abandon it and say that, oh, it doesn't work with the Galileo, forget about it. So um, in order to reverse engineer that a AF motor library, I took a motor shield apart, kind of. Uh, I took the chips right off of it and hooked it up on a breadboard. Uh, so I could figure out exactly how it picks and um, control it with the Galileo. And so I recently finished the post that sort of breaks down how the um, motor shield works. It's on uh, kidmakers.org. And so, you know, even if, if you were just kind of curious as to how the uh, version 1 works, um, it's available there and how everything is connected. Um, and then I uploaded some bare-bones code based off of uh, some shift register code from builder.org um, so that people can just immediately get started with their Galileo. Um, I have run into a couple connectivity issues um, with my Galileo, but I don't think it's, it's probably like a wire is loose or something. I'm still, still troubleshooting it. Um, but yeah, that is, that is a resource that is uh, freely available um, on that website. And then I guess uh, John can talk a little bit more about the Sun Simulator. So yeah, I've been working on a Sun Simulator with a coworker of ours, Katie, and we actually have it somewhat up and running. I tried getting it 
running right now, but the code for some reason inverted. But uh, if we turn around the laptop, we can show them. Oh, there we go. So, sundial. so this is a sun simulator. Uh, currently, the lights are on all the time instead of being off all the time. Uh, the code has I don't know why it did this, but I figured the present maybe not. But um, so right now, what it's doing is just iterating through all the different positions of the sun, and kids will be able to come to, come into the museum, make a sundial, and plant it right here. And then we have our fancy button off to the side that they can push to iterate it. But I have it running automatically right now. Oh, uh, and if, uh, eventually with the Galileo, uh, we hope to use its like internet capabilities, hook it up with a simple world clock, and so if you know kids want to see like what the time is in some other country, they can press it, and then the sundial will switch to like that country. This would be so beautiful in conjunction with I Darren's know, project, you know? Sun position, <laughs> temperature. temperature, water yeah. in your face. It's going to be awesome. Cat and and there? cats in there somehow, right? <laughs> 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 oh, that's fantastic. I love it. We're going to have a lot of cross mashup possibilities yeah. here. I know it. Probably um, exhibits. Right. exhibits, exactly. That could work. Cool. Yeah. And I know that um, you've got other things cooked up at Houston as well that you shared the first podcast, but I just want to reiterate um, that you're adapting and working on trying to get with the motors uh, an eggbot type platform. Um, you guys can speak to that. And also that you've made a 3D model of the Intel Galileo, which is super handy for people in their prototyping. Just that if you'd like. Okay. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've been on break. I was in Florida for a week, so uh, I haven't developed anything. Uh, new since our last uh, hangout, but yeah, we do. We did develop a 3D model of the Galileo, kind of uh, allow people to design uh, either enclosures or uh, mounting holes, that kind of thing. Um, it is the version one, or I guess the older version, because I know the there's a new revision of the board, um, and I think the layout is uh, a little bit different. So if I get my hands on one of those. Uh, I could probably update the CAD model. Uh, and then here's a, a kind of, this is an egg bot that we developed here. And if you open up the electronics bay, um, you'll see it has, well, kind of hard to see, but it has some mounting holes. And I tried to, uh, uh, I put different types of um, mounting configurations. Right now we have a, an Uno in there, but the holes do fit a Galileo in case uh, someone wants to uh, implement it. So, yeah. That's uh, super cool. We uh, do have some more uh, kind of hardware platforms. Um, I am more of like a hardware guy, and I love catting. So that's kind of like how I was able to contribute kind of like to develop these uh, robotic and fun uh, platforms for people to play with. That's super cool. Yeah. Thanks for giving us up to date on your current projects, um, which gets me really excited about hearing about what's possible for revisions of the Galileo. If we could get Carlos to speak a little bit about what's uh, what the future of this tool is, and then we'll uh, start to discuss some specifics about other possibilities and what the Galileo means uh, for education in particular. So, Gal uh, so Carlos, if you can unmute and uh, share a little bit what you can about Future, the future of Galileo and, and boards like it. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, as, as you guys uh, talked about, we, we released a second version, uh, I think a, a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, uh, and so people are getting their hands on that. Uh, they're starting to play with it. Uh, all the firmware, you know, all that stuff is starting to catch up. Um, uh, and so I, the, we, don't, we don't have another... Uh, a, a Galileo 3 yet on our roadmap, but uh, I know folks are looking at what's next. Uh, what's next with uh, with Galileo? Uh, and as Steve mentioned, uh, we we do have another uh, board coming out called an Edison board, uh, and and that's 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 going to be coming out later later on this in the fall. Uh, and so that's another development platform for you guys. Um, and from you know speaking from a just from an education perspective, because that's Kind of what my, that's what my job is. 
uh, and and uh, the whole notion in terms of us doing this work is uh, is how do we how do we create platforms for uh, quick prototyping so that the kids can can easily go from idea to prototyping, and that's the type of stuff that Steve saw over at the uh, Lighthouse. Uh, and so we want to give the the students uh, or the kids an opportunity to um, uh, if they want to get into the code, if they want to get into the the, the technical aspects they can, uh, but they don't have to. And so the whole notion of building uh, a platform uh, that has uh, Wi-Fi, that has sensors, uh, that has inputs and outputs, and then it's a uh, web-enabled interface so that you can come up with, on your, with your phone and connect, right? Connect the inputs to the outputs and not have to mess with with the code. It's, it's the type of stuff that we're trying to figure out in terms of how do we how do we scaffold? How do we get get, get started and, and not drift uh, too far from uh, from you know appealing to kids that may not know that they're technical yet, uh, and as a way to get them uh, interested in in, in uh, playing with technology. That's all super cool to hear. I, I think that what I'm hearing is really awesome because we we've seen as early adopters of the Galileo that. It's not the easiest board to get into, but it's getting progressively easier and easier as folks like you see here are developing and adapting oh. tools and, and motor shields that would uh, otherwise not be usable, things like that. But what I saw, to, to piggyback off of Carlos's contest, last week I saw in representatives from Intel come and prototype a, a, an educational kit with middle schoolers at Lighthouse Charter School here in Oakland, California. And it was quite remarkable, really, because it really opened my eyes to the power of this sort of tool once we really get the kinks worked out and we get many different versions, uh, or, or the adaptability of it was amazing. What was powerful about this, um, what I saw, was that the Galileo with the $10 or $15 um, Wi-Fi card um, acts as a hotspot, and you can connect to it with any touchscreen device like your phone or tablet or a laptop. Um, go to a website and directly control motors, lights, connect and wire, uh, button inputs, um, and in the future, anything you can imagine as far as two-way control, um, eventually sensor feedback, that sort of thing, for example, which got me real excited because when you are learning to program robots, um, a really big leap is to see inside the mind of a robot exactly what are the sensor values, for example, if you're calibrating, or what's this motor doing in response to this motor. Um, what Carlos was talking about was providing a way that's really simple at first to use this powerful technology through a, an interface that this generation, that's our students right now, have almost always known, which is this touch interface. So very few boards out there are as equipped to do that as this, um, especially as, as inexpensively, uh, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's quite remarkable. But um, I'm going to share a few pictures of that experience, if you guys don't mind, because yeah. we've got to see these awesome yeah. middle schoolers, and what they were invited to do was create a creature that they then animated through these touchscreen devices like tablets and the phones uh, to bring their creatures to life. So I'm going to share a few pictures here from my iPhoto library. And, uh, one in there. Oh, the joys of screen sharing. All right. So we'll do so. a different one. Uh, is that, well, maybe the different one. Let's yeah, you want to do the different. Yes, I do. That's why Nancy's here. <laughs> it's actually Bottom, that one right there. Yeah. There we go. I'm so glad everybody sees this live. <laughs> All right. So let me get to that screen so I can actually navigate through there. You see the board. Uh, their first introduction was, you know, figuring out how to wire it up, plug it in. But very quickly, these students started tinkering with it. And of course, being kids and given the freedom to do so, this group in particular decided they wanted to plug it, everything in they could possibly plug it in on. And uh, that led to some shorting and things like that, but they were really pushing the limits of what was capable of the, the kit, which actually the representatives from Intel, another Carlos, um, really loved. He loved that tinkering approach. You can see them um, starting to connect crash materials to the servos and the lights, oh, gosh. including origami, and oh. um, I'm going to go through kind of fast here, just to give you an impression of, of, it was about an hour and a half, two hour workshop that these children were, or these students were given a chance to explore and create with. Um, and this was a middle school group? Yes, this is a middle school group. They're doing a summer program. And you can see Carlos right there. The other, not the Carlos that's on right now, another Carlos, and other representatives from Intel, they're supporting this use. This is one of our MakerCore mentors, Becca. 
Becca, member uh, still. Yeah, <laughs> member still. Mentor soon. Mentor. Yeah. <laughs> so these uh, creations that they made based on boxes uh, really came to life. Uh, see them kind of kind of doing a oh, gallery wait, walk. Wait, wait, is that what? What is that one? Which one? The the box. The box there? Yeah. It's kind of a cat creature. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. This I thought was really exciting. This was a, a, a drawing that came up before of what they thought their creature might look like in the lights. You can see the interaction there. Afterwards, they were so excited what they built, they started to think, what's the future? And this is after the whole session. He goes and he draws legs. He's like, I want to get this thing That's to move. That's so interesting. That's so familiar. You know, I really love that <laughs> whole process of a tiny little sketch in the beginning, but then going back to a notebook afterwards um, to kind of say, what's possible in the future with this? And knowing of the servos and everything like that, this was a real eye-opener about the kids seeing the potential of a board like this. Um, what, what's possible in the future is one of my favorite questions. Yeah. It's, like, it's not just what you get a little taste of, that these uh, students did get a taste of the experience, but what they would plan for if they had more time. Yeah. Um, so that, to me, is one of the most powerful things you can do in education, is to just show potential and possibility and invite um, something that's very complex and very powerful into any a yeah. classroom or educational environment. So uh, any thoughts in general about the use of uh, Intel in education or its power, its potential from our participants here? And I've spoken about it. Carlos has spoken a little bit about it. Any ideas? Is this something that you guys would wish that you had had when you were children? Or um, can you imagine capabilities that would make this very compelling to introduce in the classroom or a program at your museum, for example? Yeah. Well, let's go with Darren. Darren. Okay. Hi. My turn? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I've sort of been thinking about it as an Arduino with two shields, maybe some more that I, maybe three really, built in, um, which I think is really great. I've taught a number of introduction to Arduino or introduction to interaction design type of courses, and People are always, you know, they start with the Arduino and then they want to build something a little more complicated, so they have to order an Ethernet shield or they have to order an SD card module. And although it's great practice to learn how to plug those things in, I think it's really awesome that the Galileo offers all of those things on board. And you can really just start with so much more. It's just a bigger start or more possibilities in the beginning than OK, you're limited to some inputs and outputs. And even though that's a lot to handle when you're just starting out, also to throw in, you can connect to the internet, or you can store something, or you can read from an SD card. That really, I think, takes it up a few levels. So. Yeah, I, um, I want to piggyback off of that. I showed this in the first Hangout that we had, but I'll show it again, because it d directly relates to your observation about the board. The Galileo, and I don't mean for this to sound like a big Galileo advertisement, but the simple <laughs> fact is it's a lot of bang for the buck. When you look at the cost of adding shields to a standard Arduino to Uno that would add Ethernet capability or Wi-Fi capability or SD card capability, those uh, shields add up in cost very quickly um, to kind of get to the equivalent power of, of the Galileo. Um, the other factor about being able to I interface to the Internet is that once you get your Arduino interface to the Internet, you still have a constraint about memory, a severe one. The Arduino is about comparable in power, and, and I know computational power, and this is not a direct relation, but very similar to a 1988-era Macintosh. Um, not a yeah. direct competition, so the techie out there, please forgive me for the... The uh, Galileo is more comparable, actually, in memory power, computational power, not necessarily speed of interface. It's a different matter. It, to a 1998 iMac. So we got a decades of difference in an era of far... Of far uh, changing technology, um, that's a lot of bang for the buck in something that ends up being a little bit cheaper, actually, with the stock Galileo and inexpensive add-ons like the PCIe or yeah, Wi-Fi card, for example. So that's exciting to me that a, a board has all those capabilities built in that isn't separate shields that would allow students to dive in with those um, modules or, and capability already built in. Definitely. Cool. Any other thoughts on the uh, educational possibilities um, and implications of boards like the Galileo and the Galileo itself? Yeah, Houston. I mean, I, I think it can't be emphasized enough um, that this board is different from um, like the Raspberry Pi 
I, and whenever I bring up the Galileo to people, they're like, oh, it's like a Raspberry Pi, but it's not. And it should be emphasized that its compatibility uh, with hardware and its position as a bridge between um, like boards like the Raspberry Pi and something as simple as the Arduino um, is, is, is really, really important. It's trying to get people who are not really familiar with Linux, perhaps, uh, to get them familiar with that uh, so they can use the Gal Galileo's internet potential uh, or even more complex capabilities. Or get people who are really good with Linux but not so good with maybe hardware uh, to get them familiar with uh, the capabilities of the Arduino. And, uh, so the Galileo is really, really important. It fills that important niche. That's an excellent point. And I'll point out that you know the Linux capability exists and you may in fact never have to use it thanks to the, the creation of tools like the folks that you see here uh, are making. Uh, so that they become modular capabilities and possibilities that can be like the libraries that you, f you find at the Arduino. The, the reason that people, one of the biggest reasons people get in their Arduino so quickly is this huge library of code that's out there that, mm -hmm. that can be adapted and learned from. Yeah. Um, this library of code that will be on the Linux side of things that ties into the library of Arduino things and the real world access that you're talking about yeah is an amazing way to learn and get going right off the bat with yeah. something that somebody else has made, even if you don't happen sense. to know Linux at all. Yep. That would be really easy. Yeah, it's a big deal. Kenny, do you have any thoughts on the, the educational possibilities of the board? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and screen share real quick. Uh, hopefully that will work. Um, yeah. All right, uh, I saw this is like I've been playing around with this web interface called Wildrian, and it is essentially it's still in prototyping phases, but it's like Scratch for the Galileo, which is like to me really really crazy, like and amazing that you can simplify it into like a visual programming language. And you can see here on, like, the sides, you can add, like, Facebook things if you want to post a message on Facebook or Twitter. And to me, it's, like, really exciting as a possibility of getting kids interacting with the web really quickly. And if they want to dive deeper, there's an option to show the code that you're actually writing in Python or JavaScript. Um, and that's something I've just been, like, really, really... Um, excited about because it, it it's starting to feel more and more accessible that we're going to be able to get kids hands on with these like really complex um, programming like possibilities if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kenny, can you can you share a little bit about the importance of being able to use languages like Java and other scripting languages? What difference that makes for possible development? Yeah, I mean, I think it, do you mean like the differences between the languages or like the importance of just knowing, learning the languages? Yeah, I mean, the differences between the languages, like why, why is it important that you can use things like JavaScript and things like that? Um, JavaScript is like a lot of <laughs> websites. Like, yeah. Web. yeah. It's, it's like the future both JavaScript and Python are sort of... I think they're the two <laughs> languages taught as well. Yeah. 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 And you can see them translated line by line and compare yep. them here to me, which is like, I'm still sort of, um, I would say, like, an experienced beginner at um, Python and JavaScript, mm -hmm. both of those languages. Um, so even just being able to compare them to me, has been a big help like this. And I think it's just um, really important for people that want to start moving forward past, um, if they want to start moving forward past, like, Arduino itself, like, programming in an IDE and start, like, thinking of engineering on a grand scale, um, I think these are, like, really important coding skills you need to pick up. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenny, can you share a little bit more for the for the educators that might not be familiar with the terms like IDE? Oh, um, yeah, that's uh, ooh. Um, so that is um, essentially like a a separate program 
for writing code into. Like when you have an Arduino, you need to have a specific program which is called an integrated development environment. I think that's what, yeah, that's what it stands for. Uh, and you have to write your code into this environment, and it has its own language. Uh, and the code only runs from that environment, really, whereas Python and JavaScript are meant to be read on a much more like universal scale and by more um, objects, I guess. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. yeah. So it just simply works in more places on more things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, less device specific, right? Yeah. That's yeah. super cool. And just also to piggyback personally about the in, uh, importance of learning JavaScript and Python, um, I remember when I got out of school and I was talking to lab mates about applying for jobs, a lot of them were saying, don't bother putting Arduino as something that you know how to program in because it's just become so not easy, but you can look up so much code and you can really sort of teach yourself so easily it might not be seen as such an important skill as knowing how to dig deeper. And so I think that's becoming increasingly important, especially as more interdisciplinary fields are popping up and knowing how to take something someone wrote and, and some code and something wrote and some code and languages like Python can really allow you to bridge between those kinds of things easily. So. Wow, what a great point that is for workforce development. Yeah. I mean, if you're investing, you know, if you're if you're investing in a microcontroller and you can go one extra step and and add Python or JavaScript yeah. or Linux to that to that key, um, that's a big deal in terms of, of standing out among, like you said, the, the the millions of people who can now claim Arduino experience, <laughs> which is a great thing to have. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, surprise! Sorry, Carl is just taking pictures of us while this is happening. So. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, I saw a camera. I thought that was it. I think that it's was part of the levity. Time. But uh, yeah. it's, it's a big deal. That was probably picture. a really good capture. We all know when you take pictures. So. Yeah. Your your mouth was open, Steve. Sorry about that. I'll erase oh it. Oh my god! <laughs> just so many hours of me looking embarrassing on the internet, oh, yeah, including so just now yeah. that, that I can't. And we no don't longer, mind. No longer capable of being embarrassed online or in person. <laughs> that might be. But it, yeah, no, these are amazing for um, for implications uh, because there's so many hooks of getting a child on this path towards useful skills um, or a mindset that can develop and learn the new languages mm -hmm. of tomorrow. I mean, a lot of newer languages that are coming out, say like Apple's Swift development environment, that are meant to use many of the hooks of Python or Java are providing new jobs in new areas because it's a language derived from scripting languages that are easier, more uh, less syntax um, uh, dependent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to make that clearer, it's it's more language like. Uh, so the traditional downside of those kind of languages is, is that they've been very slow. Uh, but newer languages are t getting away from that slowness and giving you some of the speed of more like written word language type mm. development. Um, it's I think there's some great l links to literacy and just absolutely. learning a new language of writing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey Steve, uh, I think the I watched your first the the first uh, one that you did of this, and I think there was a lot of conversations about communities and the importance of building a community a practice, right? Yeah. And and that's the other benefit of getting into these other languages is that that opens up a whole world of different community users, right? For folks that want to use these languages and learn those languages. So it's as as we look at this stuff, and I talked about. You know, how do we scaffold learning so that kids advance and progress? Connecting them to communities and practices is really, really important. Oh, absolutely. And I think the exciting thing about that, Carlos, is that you're not just learning something from the community, you're learning from the community members and their impetus to share and do things for people. Um, like we talked a lot about last time, these folks right here are doing stuff sometimes on their own time yeah. um, just to help others out. And when you are learning from others that are, do are helping out of the goodness of their heart, you're more inclined to do that yourself. So there's a lot of social emotional development that goes with seeing this world of open source sharing and the remarkable people that share um, things out of the, let's say, the desire to make things better for everybody. It's amazing. I, I, I'm very touched by it. Oh, it's <laughs> what a cool thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's awesome. Well, 
we're getting near the end of the time that we said that we were going to be uh, going 45 minutes maximum here. So I want to leave this um, last part of the conversation open to um, brainstorming together, comments on each other's work, questions that, uh, Carlos, that you might have for these Intel Explorers since you're meeting them for the first time, um, questions that you guys might have for Carlos, and also any of you viewers out there. This is a good time now yep. for any comments or questions that you might want to share via the Q&A app or YouTube comments. Um, so let's kind of leave the, the last end of this conversation open to like getting to know each other and asking each other questions. Um, that means I'm going to try not to speak for the next few minutes, which might mean a few moments of awkward silence while people figure out who talks first. Mm -hmm. Sit back and watch it happen. We actually had a question. Great. Uh, so to the people at Intel, we were wondering if they had an easy suggestion as to how to actually get Linux on the board. We've been having issue running the image that Intel supplies. And, and and you and you got the uh, the image off the I'm assuming the Intel Maker website and the, yes. and you still having issues. Yep. Uh, did you guys post? Uh, I, I think the easiest way for us it, to deal with that stuff is to post online a question uh, and see if you can get customer support. Did you guys have you guys done that? Uh, did not try that. We were just wondering if there was like a tutorial that you suggested besides the one on uh, Intel website or something along that lines. But we'll try that next. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's the that's the easiest way to get some of these technical questions. Uh, and and the thing with with our with the, our stuff is it's so brand new that we don't have the we don't we don't have that history yet built up, right? That that folks can go and, and get uh, uh, get their answers to their questions. So posting the question will be is really really useful for us also. So please please do. Will do. Uh, Carlos, can you share that website, the the help website, the Intel Maker website? Yeah, it's uh, maker.intel.com, you know, and I'll just write it up on the chat there. Okay. Maker.intel.com. And Nancy will yep. put it in the comments if... Uh, yep. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Other questions for each other? Suggestions, brainstorming, that kind of stuff? Um, I guess, let's see. Um, I, I seem to have, like... A little like some glitches with uh, respect to running the Galileo, um, the the like the okay. Excuse me. Let me get my thoughts in order. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I seem to be running into uh, some some glitches while running a motor off of the Galileo using the uh, Adafruit Motor Shield chips. Um, like the motor will will run for a little bit. It'll pick up and then keep running. Uh, and then when I plug it into an Arduino, I notice less hiccuping. And when I searched for a solution, uh, some people were telling me that uh, the emulation for Arduino and the Galileo is a little bit slow. And mm -hmm. so with faster I.O., um, perhaps that problem would be solved. Is, is that, has it, am I correct in saying that the Galileo Revision 2 will have faster emulation? Yeah, and that we've actually been testing that uh, with, uh, with SparkFun. Uh, on, on some of their shields, and, and we are finding that it, it is, it's working a lot better. Uh, well, version 2, yep. Well, what are uh, some other um, changes in version 2 that maybe make it easier and more that you think would be uh, kind of useful for today? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm some feedback. Yeah, so I was asking uh, if there are any other uh, type of improvements and updates on the version two that um, will differ from uh, version one to make it kind of easier. Uh, I I think uh, I heard about power over Ethernet. Like, yeah, how is that? Right. Yeah. Uh, something like that. How would that enable people, uh, you know, to make it easier for them? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's one example. Um, like I said, I'm 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 not a technical guy, <laughs> so I can't, I can't <laughs> okay. give you a read on all, all, all the other stuff. Uh, but uh, what what I can do is is I'll send you guys. I'm sure we have some documentation up on our website. I'll, I'll send you guys a link here uh, that that does the comparison between the two. Cool. It's a, it's a very good question. Yep. 
I can share one exciting thing, and that is that the um, idle current draw will be down considerably. Um, I believe that it was measured at about 500 milliamps, which is a which makes it difficult for robotics projects because the longevity of the battery is not super long. You get a lot of computational power on this board, but if it's drawing 500 milliamps, that's uh, not a lot of battery life. So that's one aspect of the board and the heat generation that goes along with that idle power that I believe is being addressed in New Vision 2, from what I understood. So that's very exciting. Makes it more portable. And that's the other aspect for folks that are um, listening. When they say power over Ethernet, that means that you could plug it into the Internet and have no need with an internet, Ethernet system that is so enabled. Um, you would only need one wire into that Galileo. You wouldn't need a separate power source. So you, would, you could hide these things in, in the environments as long as you had an Ethernet cable there. And all that the board needed in terms of power and connection to the Internet would come through that one Ethernet cable. Um, that would depend on an environment that's set up for power over Ethernet. But it is nice because it's one less cord, one less power thing, one less degree of complexity. Yes. Cool. We've got about another minute of, uh, or we can just uh, wrap it up by saying, you know, let's check our Q&A channel one more time. Well, looks like we have any questions today. Yeah, which That's is quite okay. Which is all right. Um, you can continue <laughs> to ask questions on the, the channel. If mm -hmm. you're a part of our Maker Ed community, um, you may ask questions there. If you're part of our Maker Core community, we have uh, questions there. Maker Ed community, which you can find at makered.org slash community. It's a Google community link that you'll find there. It's public for it's everyone. Public yeah. for everybody, yeah. Our Maker Core folks is, is private to the Maker Core folks, but um, many of them are watching right now. So. This has been fun. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I get more and more excited by this board all the time because of the things that are being done on the software side, hardware side. It's a hook and a, and a connector to many things. It's going to have easy ways to start, and then you'll never outgrow it because you'll have this whole wide inter Internet <laughs> out there to use. Yeah. It's, a, it's a portal to the Internet of Things. It's a portable touch interface. It's a portal to learning new languages. Um, it's remarkable in education because you can choose what route you want to go. It's kind mm -hmm. of like you choose your own adventure uh, possibility yeah. type thing. So, I want to thank you guys all for joining us today. We'll keep yeah. it at a 45-minute thing. Um, thank you for watching. Yeah, thanks for watching. And also check the comments on our Google event page that will share the links to the blogs that are being kept by our Intel explorers here and all the free work that they're doing for you to make your experience and your students experience if you're an educator better. So thank you everybody. Thank Thanks you Carlos everybody. for representing Intel. Thank you Darren. And education. Thank you children. Thank Thanks Thank you. guys. Yeah, we appreciate it. I, I almost hate to go because but I do get to hang out with you a little bit after we end this. So but thank you all and um, we'll we'll let you know in the future when we do more of these. All right. And uh, end the broadcast here if I can figure out the bundle. Where is the button been the podcast? <laughs> There's no end broadcast There's button. There's no end there. broadcast no. button. Oh, this is this is hilarious. Uh, get rid of that. There it is. Okay. Found it. We're <laughs> oh, still stopping. We're still live, guys. We're still live. It's stopping. I, I thought we'd go a whole Google Hangout without a Google Hangout glitch.